This is an extract from Modern Railway Working, which was published in 1914, and is the um, at that time was the um, way in which most railways in uh, across the British Isles uh, functioned, and of course railways across the world as well. So this one is about signalling and train control, and the first part uh, covers the principles of signalling, the design of signal cabins. Um, the simplest form of train protection, which was used before telegraphic and telephonic communication came into use, was to divide the line into sections or blocks with a passing loop at each block station. Trains were then dispatched in the same direction after a fixed interval of time, which was determined according to the length of the section. Instructions were given to the guard to proceed to the next passing station and, after waiting for the oncoming trains or train in the opposite direction to pass, to proceed to the next station, where he would receive further instructions. As a rule, trains were run according to a timetable, which specified where the opposing trains were to cross, or fast trains were to overtake the preceding slow ones. However, it was sometimes necessary, owing to late running of certain trains, to alter the fixed schedule. These alterations frequently led to misunderstandings and disastrous collisions, and in order to avoid this, the official responsible for the traffic over a district issued permits which gave the driver authority to proceed, and also stated where the train was required to shunt. This system was still in use in America to a large extent, but is not now used in this country. Another system, which is sometimes used for temporary working of single lines, is to appoint a pilotman, who has to ride upon the engine of every train occupying the section. Very often, however, several trains require to proceed in the same direction, and in order that the pilotman should accompany each train, he would have to walk back, unless a light engine could be used for this purpose. This would mean considerable delay to the traffic, and, in order to obviate this, permits were carried by the pilotman and were issued to the drivers of the preceding trains, pilotmen travelling on the last train. Train staffs were used in much the same way. The permits were kept in a staff box, fixed in the station master's office or signal cabin. This box could only be opened by the insertion of the train staff, thus it followed that permits could only be granted when in possession of the staff, with the withdrawal of which locked the box. The staffs were painted in distinctive colours and engraved with the names of the stations between which they were available. Moreover, it should be impossible to open a staff box in one section with the staff of another section. The weak point of this arrangement is that in the event of A requiring to send a train to B, whilst B is in possession of the staff, he cannot do so until B is able to send the staff by special messenger. All the three forms of single line working which have now been almost entirely superseded by the electric tablet and electric staff instruments, which are both designed to overcome the difficulties mentioned, and reference will, to these will be made later. Working without signals. Signals may be dispensed with on single lines under the following conditions. First, that all stations and siding connections upon a line worked by one engine only or two engines coupled together, carrying a staff, and when all points are locked by such staff. Second, at any intermediate siding connection upon a line worked under the train staff and ticket system, or under the electric staff or tablet system, when the points are locked by the staff or tablet. And third, at intermediate stations, which are not staff or tablet stations, upon a line worked under the electric staff or tablet system, sidings, if any, being locked as in the first two uh, d um, instances. The first consideration for the, for the selection of sites for cabins and their construction is that governing the most suitable position for the signal cabin. It should be placed as nearly as possible midway between the extreme points which require to be worked bearing in mind that the Board of Trade will not allow a greater distance than 250 yards in the case of manually worked facing points, and 300 yards if power worked, whilst 300 yards is also the limit for trailing points. It should also be possible for the signalman to have a clear view of his roads and signals while standing at the levers, 
which operate those roads, and at the same time it is an advantage for him to be near enough to the line to be able to communicate verbally with the drivers and guards of trains. Should it be necessary to locate the cabin near any standing works which would obstruct the view, it is often an advantage to have bay windows, such as, are, such as are to be seen in nearly all signal cabins in America. Having decided upon the site, it becomes necessary to determine on the type of cabin, and this largely depends upon the nature of the ground and the materials at hand. If the ground is virgin soil, a stone or brick cabin is preferable. Some engineers, however, prefer a brick or stone lower part with a wood upper structure from a sill just below floor level. If the ground is loose and unstable, as is often the case in mining districts, a cabin entirely of wood built upon piles is most suitable. One advantage of a wood cabin is that it can be easily moved to a new site without dismantling, but it does not compare with the other types as regards durability or comfort to the signalman. Another type of cabin which can be used when there is not sufficient ground room is one made of wood carried upon an iron bridge across the lines of way, but this is not to be recommended except as a last resource, as there are many difficulties, not the least being that, that of arranging the lead out for the rods and wires. The figures show cabins of two patterns which are standard on the London Brighton and South Coast Railway. The illustrations are so clear that very little explanation is necessary. The following points, however, are worthy of note. The foundations must be carried down to solid ground, the minimum depth being shown on the drawing. The footings and depth of concrete will, of course, depend upon the height of cabin above ground. Cast iron wall boxes may be built in at the front, back or ends as required, or a very good alternative is to place three or four old rails extending the whole length of the cabin with cast iron supports about every ten feet to provide opening an opening for connections. Old rails should be built into the brickwork about thirteen inches above rail level and extending from back to front at about seven foot centres. They should stand out at least three feet from the front of the cabin in order that the outside timbers may be bolted down to them. The inside timbers should be 12 inches by 6 inches, red fir, clean sawn on all sides and should cover the floor space between the apparatus timber and the wall on the locking frame side. The rest of the flooring which is not required for fixing down cranks etc may be of 9 inch by 3 inch laid with about 1 inch space between each this provides sufficient ventilation to prevent rotting. It is a good plan to use 12 inch by 5 inch timbers for the outside lead off. This will allow a straight connection from the pedestal cranks to the medium high accommodation, accommodating cranks and a set up or set down connection to the high and low accommodating cranks. The carriage timber for the apparatus must be fixed according to the type of locking frame which it has to support and should preferably extend the whole length of the cabin resting upon a stone bed at each end or in the case of a wooden cabin securely fixed into a cast iron pocket attached to the timber uprights of the cabin end. Care must be taken that it is free from twists especially if the apparatus is one in which each lever is carried in a separate shoe otherwise the levers will not be in line. 12 inch by 6 inch timber supports are required about 10 feet apart to prevent any sagging. With regards to floor trimming, an opening in the floor must be made for the apparatus. This will require a timber framing into which the floor joints are to be fixed. It will also form an additional support by taking up the thrust of the apparatus. The floorboard should be either tongued and grooved or ploughed and battened on the underside in order to prevent water from running through into the locking boxes. The latter method is to be preferred as the boards wear much longer before breaking the joints. Windows should be as large as possible with the glass in large frames not subdivided into small panes otherwise it becomes very difficult for the signalman to see clearly at an angle owing to the great amount of woodwork. Sliding sashes are also better than lifting ones 
and should be provided at each end and also in the middle in the case of a large cabin. A painted name board, or better still, a board with cast iron letters screwed on, will, will be required on the outside of the cabin. A stage with handrail must be provided for cleaning the windows and a water bath or galvanised iron tank for holding rainwater. Receptacles for coal and ash and a water closet must also be included. The furniture will consist of one locker for each signalman, one general stores locker, a stool, desk, notice board, footboard, battery cupboard and stove. The latter will not be required if an open fireplace is built.